Good morning and happy Tuesday. If you haven't met me yet, my name is Heather and this is my garden. I'm gardening in southwestern Kentucky, zone 7B. We have a raised bed garden and a greenhouse and so much is coming to fruition. Just the other day, my daughter came to me excitedly and said, mommy, one of your tomatoes is turning peach. So these are our heirloom Belgian giants. This is a small one here. So at first, when they're starting to ripen, they go from green to this creamy color. And then you'll slowly start to see a yellow and a peach. And then this particular variety doesn't ripen to a bright cherry red. It's this gorgeous salmon color. And I'm very, very excited that these are starting to ripen. They're so good. This is a good hefty one, definitely over a pound. It's been a pretty dry couple weeks here and I have been watering by hand. We're going to get some rain a little bit later today and Mother Nature can water much better than I can and I know that the plants are about to receive a really good deep watering that they have been desperately needing. And in keeping that in mind, I am going to harvest some of these tomatoes that have started to ripen but they're not that perfect salmon color quite yet. What I'm trying to avoid is having tomatoes that split because of getting a lot of rain at once. So I am gonna take, if I can get it off, I might need my scissors. Oops, I stabbed the other tomato with the scissors, but. So see, this one has definitely started to ripen. Once they've started to ripen like this, they can absolutely finish ripening on the counter. So to save these guys from the deluge of rain, which will also serve to kind of dilute their flavor, I'm gonna take these off today. Some of the ones at eye level are starting to get really big as well. And once the first ones ripen, it's really not long and it's just an amazing domino effect of a red flush that will come in in this tunnel. I'm excited for you to see it. Addy, come here. Tisa. Is that one sour? Kind of. Kind of, wasn't quite ready. This is a thornless blackberry plant that our friend gave us. We haven't found a spot to put it in the ground yet, but the blackberries are starting to ripen a little bit. In general, blackberries can be a little bit sour if they're harvested while they're still kind of shiny. If you wait for them to get nice and dark and to dull up a little bit, that's their maximum sweetness. These guys aren't quite ready yet. The melons over here finally started to take off. I'm seeing a lot of male flowers on here. It makes sense because if it were all just female flowers and no male flowers, there would really be no hope for that fruit coming to fruition. So as part of the design of this melon, the male flowers come first and they're just going to be there ready and waiting for the pollinators as soon as the female flowers come on. Along this tomato row here, I do have some onions that I planted on the other side of the trellis. They're really starting to fall over, which is a good thing. The bulb is forming quite well just below the mulch. And as the onions are starting to die back, I've noticed that there's quite a few tomato volunteers in this bed that have taken root from plants that I had here last year. 
Now I think around this section, I had a tomato, a cherry tomato that was yellow with purple shoulders. I think it was called the blueberry cream tomato. I'm pretty sure that's what this volunteer is. And I think that not only because of the location of this volunteer, but the stem of the plant has this purple coloring to it. And tomatoes that have any kind of purple shade on them, like a black beauty tomato or something like that, they generally will have a little bit of purpling on their stems. Sometimes purpling on tomato plants, especially on the underside of the leaves, can indicate a nutrient deficiency. But right here, that's just part of the genetics of this plant. As the onions are dying back to the understory volunteers, these are Cape Gooseberry. They are really starting to do well. You can see there's a lot of flea beetle damage on these plants. I did come through a couple days ago with some diatomaceous earth and sprinkled it on the plants. And you can see that the new growth is a lot healthier. My friend JC at Steadfast Trail Farm let me know that the best time to harvest the Brad's Atomic Grape tomatoes are when they get a really nice bright yellow. She said really before they get that nice bright yellow they have a kind of underwhelming flavor and she's definitely right. So these guys are close to being able to be picked. But this one, let's get it. This one has nice bright yellowy orange. You can also tell by the firmness. This one does have some give to it, while this one here really just doesn't. These guys do have the benefit of having this yellow coloring to help determine ripeness, but on tomatoes that do ripen predominantly green, one of the ways that you can tell that they're ripe is doing a squish test. And you don't wanna squeeze really hard, but you can tell the difference between a tomato that is ripe or ripening. It's definitely got some give to it. Whereas a tomato that's not ripe is very hard. I mean, you can imagine what you'd rather bite into and if it's something you probably wouldn't want to eat, then it's probably not ready. I finally got to mulching the cucumber bed. It was really essential the last couple weeks for this bed to be covered. I did only get to it yesterday. Thankfully, these plants stayed healthy through all of that heat, but one of the main benefits of mulch is being able to keep the soil moisture contained where the plants need it most and to help keep the soil cool. The cucumbers are doing really well. And while I was mulching, I found another gooseberry volunteer. Gooseberries are definitely one of those plants that you can plant once and then just have them forever. I love that quality about them. Our bush beans have really come to life. They're doing excellently. This is actually the third time I have planted bush beans. I tried twice in my greenhouse and they got taken out by slugs. And so this is the third time and we finally have sizable plants. It's definitely one of the great things about bush beans and probably pole beans, legumes in general, is that they have a generally short seed to crop time. I think these bush beans are a 60 day. On the back of your seed packet, the seeds will tell you just about how long from planting the seed in order to get a harvest. Sometimes with things like bell peppers and tomatoes, that harvest time assumes that you're putting out an eight week old transplant into the ground. But with bush beans, that timeline is from planting the seed. And I think in most places, you can plant beans right now and get a harvest. Speaking of harvest, I was just out here yesterday or the day before harvesting beans and beans generally come on very, very fast. I will say that the initial flush of beans came on a lot faster than the subsequent flushes of beans. I haven't ever grown this variety before, but I am suspicious that the heat and the drought situation is affecting our yields a little bit. 
I do see quite a lot more flowers, so we do have more beans coming in the future, that's for sure. During the last garden tour, I mentioned that this variety of pole bean, this is the Slippery Silks pole bean, wasn't my favorite because it's really tough, it's really stringy, and soon after posting, I did a little bit of research and realized that this variety of pole bean is actually grown for the dry seed. See that bean in there? That will mature to red. It'll get nice and fat and then we'll be able to leave those beans on the plant, allow them to dry out, and then harvest the pods, open up the shells, and harvest the dry beans inside. So I've decided to leave this plant on here because I've never grown a drying bean before. I don't think we'll get a whole ton, maybe a meal's worth, but it's still exciting anyway. You see this? This is bad news. This beautiful thing is a squash vine borer. It's a gorgeous, very, very bad bug. That I apparently let fly away while I was talking about it. But it's important that you see that because it's not a pollinator. It looks a lot like a moth, kind of like a moth mixed with like a wasp, but they are very, very bad for your squash plants. Here's some squash bug eggs. These are not the eggs of the squash vine borer, but this is another pest. I have seen the squash vine borer lay their eggs on basically all parts of the plant. Um, they're pretty much detrimental anywhere, but the worst part for them to be is the main stem of the plant. So right here at the base of the plant, which is hidden in there among strawberries, which I'm hoping helps this plant out, you'll see a little tiny coppery colored egg on the stem. Looks a lot like those cluster of squash bug eggs, except for they're not in a cluster. It is just one single egg, and that makes it really hard to find. One of the ways that you can combat the squash vine borer is to put down DT. And that stands for a really long name that I'm gonna put down below. But what that particular organic pesticide does is it targets the larval stage of the pest. So any kind of caterpillar consumes BT, and I think what it does is it stops their digestive process and kills them because they just stop eating, which is good because when they eat, they destroy your plant. The squash vine borer larvae will bore right into the stem of your plant and basically cut off the nutrition. You can tell when the squash vine borer has bored into the plant because there's almost this sawdusty type area near where that larva has bored into your plants. They are very aptly named. The elephant garlic is looking really sickly and dead and gross. And this is actually a good thing. What it's doing is taking all of that energy that it's collected out of the sun and placing it down into the bulb, which is what we harvest and eat. I'm gonna wait for these to completely die back. I did harvest one the other day. Let's go under the carport and check it out. So it's not the hugest of elephant garlic bulbs, but it's my first and I'm proud. I'm pretty sure this knob on the end is just one clove. Isn't that really cool? All of these little mini cloves on the bottom, there's a name for them. I'm pretty sure that when you see these, it means that you've harvested a little late. I've grown some garlic before, but not a lot. I've still got some learning to do. I keep forgetting to show you this, but I took some tomato suckers off of some of our indeterminate tomato plants over here, and I just stuck them in the soil and continued to water this green stalk. And I have a couple tomato plants coming up in here. So this is obviously not an ideal situation. They're going to be kind of competing for nutrients with the strawberries, but how funny is that? There's even some flowers on this one. So you may not already be aware, but indeterminate tomato plants 
just grow indeterminately. They will grow forever and ever as long as you give them nutrients and support. And another really cool thing about indeterminate tomato plants is that you can take off the suckers of the plant and root them just like I did in the green stock over there. And you'll get an entirely new plant that you didn't have to start from seed. And that gives you a really big advantage if you're trying to grow more tomato plants later on in the season when you don't really have eight weeks to spare to get them up to that size. So right here we have a main stem of the tomato plant. It actually travels up this twine here. There's this sun leaf and then in between the main stem and the sun leaf, this decently sized sucker has formed. And what you can do is actually, ideally with pruners, take off the sucker and this will grow roots when you put it in water or put it in soil and then be an entirely new tomato plant. I found this volunteer down here too the other day and we're gonna let that grow. Before this greenhouse had plants in it, I actually had three pigs and I think it was nine ducks in the greenhouse working the ground and getting things ready for planting. And so we gave them excess rotten tomatoes, some split melons and a whole bunch of things. And even though I have a bunch of woven ground cover in here suppressing weed pressure or volunteer pressure, we still have quite a few volunteers in here. One of them is getting really, really big. Look at this melon. Isn't that amazing? And this is the volunteer Kajari melon where I know I saw a baby melon coming on. See that? Got a little baby fruit at the base of the flower. This was a female flower. The flower is now spent because the fruit is pollinated. Hey, I was hoping you would stay, but I've always known that you would go find your own way. The plants along the center aisle in the greenhouse are all determinant varieties of tomatoes and they are pretty much done putting on flowers. There's very few flowers left in here. So what the plants are focusing on now is ripening all the fruit they have, which is a whole bunch. <laughs> See, there's a couple flowers up here, but mostly there's not a whole ton of flowers anymore. It's all translating to beautiful, beautiful fruit clusters. Look at this one. Heard you want to leave this place But we grew up this old town Just leave it all behind The river's gonna cry when you're gone so some of the clusters are really, really heavy. They've even bogged down the trellising system that I have here. And they were actually touching the ground. Our drip tape irrigation system is right here. And I wanted to avoid the fruit getting wet and possibly rotting on the vine. So I stuck this 1020 tray under them and it's shielding them quite well. Under the cover of the greenhouse, that works really well because there's no rain coming from above that will fill up that 1020 tray. If there was, you could use something like they make little melon hammocks that have holes in them that the water can pass through. You could definitely put one of those under a low lying cluster. Just like the beans, you think you're done and then you see one. Heard you want to leave this place, but we grew up this old town. Just put it all behind. Remember, you and I would always find somewhere to hide when we were kids, so we could see and hear the water run. The river's gonna cry when you're gone.
have been down here picking a few peppers that I've needed for a couple recipes that I've had. They've been about this size when I've picked them, which isn't quite fully ripe, but you can pick peppers really at any size. Most of these I am gonna allow to get a little bit bigger, but here's what we've got basically right now on all of these plants. Some of our Amish friends actually came over here the other day on their horse and they came in the greenhouse and asked, Heather, what are you gonna do with all of those peppers? And we really, really enjoy sweet peppers for fresh eating. They're one of our kids' favorite fresh foods. And one of the ways that I like to preserve peppers is to dice them and put them straight in the freezer. You can saute them straight out of the freezer and put them in things like omelets, casseroles on pizzas. So peppers are definitely a favorite here. That's why we have so many. As far as the jalapenos go, I don't love spicy peppers, my husband does, but I do really enjoy a tiny bit of a kick in our salsas. So I've got to come down here in a little bit because I've got plenty of tomatoes to make some roasted salsa. We are growing a heatless variety of jalapeno called the nada peño. These look like a regular jalapeno, but without the spice. Admittedly, the flavor's been a little bit underwhelming to me, but this one is better than the first one that I tried. So maybe they need to sit on the plant a little bit longer, get a little bit bigger, and develop a little bit more flavor. We're also growing heatless habaneros. They're called habanadas, and we're all really interested to see what these will taste like. Got some little flowers there, and tiny, tiny peppers. It's a little bit of a bigger one. These tomatoes here are an orange pear tomato. This tomato is new to us this year. We have grown the yellow pear tomato a lot in years past. This particular tomato here and in the kids' garden is the only tomato that we have seen out of all of the tomatoes that we have that are experiencing blossom end rot. And in general, blossom end rot can point to a calcium deficiency in the soil. I put down gypsum in the greenhouse before I planted anything in here. Not to say that the greenhouse isn't deficient in calcium, but peppers and tomatoes will both get blossom end rot with a deficiency in calcium. And out of all of the tomatoes that I have and all of the peppers that I have, this particular variety of tomato is the only one doing this. So if any of you have any ideas of what could be causing this on this plant alone, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Look, there's a whole bunch right here. My guineas will find them. The hog panel on the sides of the greenhouse was something that we put in when we had literal hogs inside the greenhouse. But it has been a really, really great thing to have anyway, to keep the dog out and to keep the guineas out. And really, I guess, any other garden pest that would be really too big to fit through the holes. Our drip irrigation is running right now, but like I said, we're about to get a whole bunch of rain. This is my timer. I'm just gonna shut that off. I can actually set that timer to run at certain intervals. I can have it run on certain days. I can have it water for a certain length of time. It's been really awesome to have that. I think it was only $40 and I bought it from Haas Tools. <laughs> actually hear the thunder. The storms weren't supposed to come until later, but I want to make sure that some of my outside goats are fed. Hey, Juniper. Hi, baby. Let's go over here. We 
We've actually started our breeding groups for some of our Nigerian dwarf goats, and we have a little extra here today. Our friends Megan and Reagan over at GWP Homestead brought one of their dolings here that's related to the buck that they have over there, and she's gonna breed havoc and bring some awesome new genetics onto their farm. 